So thank you very much, Tom, um, for opening this fourth panel. Uh, my name is Christian Kopp. I'm a curator and historian and activist for Berlin Postcolonial. Um, we are a rather small NGO and is situated or based in Berlin, but we, and it is important for me and a privilege to point this out, out uh, we are working in a, in a bigger alliance of NGOs in Berlin, uh, especially working on the national level, because Berlin is a place of our government. And this uh, alliance is called uh, No Amnesty on Genocide oder, or Völkermord verjährt nicht. And this was founded in 2011 uh, around one person who's uh, present here and with us. Uh, it's Israel Kaunachike, the overheaded um, activist in Berlin. And I would like you to uh, applause, give an applause for him. So as I said, we um, are a, kind, a handful of NGOs um, um, surrounding uh, the activities of uh, Israel Kaunatike and supporting him and uh, of course also uh, the activities of the victim societies uh, in Namibia and in the USA. Um, we were founded in 2011 and the occasion was the return, uh, the handing over of a first parcel, so to say, of human remains from the Charité in 2011. And this was the moment when we said we should start doing work on a continuous basis. And uh, it is really hard for me to remember all the things uh, we have done since 2011, because it's quite a long time. Um, but um, uh, it wouldn't have been possible without the initiative of um, the NGOs in, and the victim society, of course, in Namibia, because we are supporting a cause which is, in a way, not ours, even if it is Israel's cause as well. Um, so I would like to name the NGOs as well. Uh, this is Africa Avenir, this is Futur Afrik, um, the Berliner Entwicklungspolitischer Ratschlag in Berlin, and especially active is the initiative of black people in Germany, who is also the organizer of this conference here, as it is a national organization, not based on one town only. Um, so when in, um, it was already said that this is the second transnational Overheredo and uh, Nama Congress, so we had the first one, which was in the fall of 2016. <clears throat> and I'm overwhelmed uh, by, the, by your attention here and uh, uh, your presence here um, and by such a big audience because I would like to remember that we had a, a room of the same size in 2016, but if it wasn't had been for the NAMA delegation being here now with 20 people, um, who came with 50 persons from Namibia and the USA, if it wouldn't have been for them to fill the room, it would have been almost empty. Uh, there were maybe 30 to 50 people from Berlin. So it's a big success now to see you here, uh, more than 100 people, I guess, maybe 200, uh, listening to the stories uh, from Namibia. So thank you very much for coming here. Um, when I was asked to, to moderate this panel, I was uh, not hesitating for a moment because it's a big pleasure to, to moderate um, a panel with three people I wouldn't hesitate to call friends by now. I, I know them for quite a while, for some years, and I can assure you that this is a great it has always been a big pleasure uh, to cooperate with them and to exchange mails and to see each other now and then, usually in Germany. Um, so the first person I would like to introduce, and this is uh, our first speaker here, is uh, Kambanda Wei. She is a teacher by profession and uh, she completed her teaching education in Scotland in the United Kingdom. Um, and she taught for more than 20 years at a rural school in Okakara, Okakara in Namibia. 
And before she uh, resigned her job and started her own business, business, she served as an executive member of, our, uh, of the National Teachers Union called Nantu, where she played a significant role in negotiating better salaries for the teachers. She was also a member of the committee that drafted the guidelines for the Child Care and Protection Bill in 2006. Um, Kambanda is a community activist who has taken part in various attempts to better the lives of the people in Namibia. She has established a charity organization called Aspiration Org, which deals with mainly the youth offering mentorship, job placements and support. Um, they also give out donations in form of cloth, blankets and stationery, etc. to the less fortunate people in Namibia. Kambanda joined the fight and struggle for restorative justice shortly after she was introduced. It was introduced by the late paramount chief of the Ovaherero, Dr. Riruaku. And currently she is the secretary of the Ovaherero Genocide Foundation, OGF. She's a direct descendant uh, of a woman. It is her great grandmother who brought her up, who experienced the genocide and survived it during her teen years. So I would like to welcome Kambanda to give uh, an insight into her presentations now. Thanks. Good afternoon to everyone. I hope you are well rested and being well fed. Not too much because I don't want you to fall asleep while I'm talking. <laughs> yeah, um, first of all, I would like to look at what actually happened during the genocide years. We always hear about the genocide, but we never actually know what happened. It, it was not just the shooting. A lot more happened during those years. Um, I would like to start by mentioning that in 1884 up to 1915, the present day Namibia was a German colony. The settlers went there, and instead of actually talking to the people there and negotiating on land and so on, they just felt these are not really people. They are animals. They have a lot of land and they have a lot of cattle. So let's just take it away from them. And so the war started. The Ovaherero and the Nama people were not happy about the way the Germans were taking off their land and their cattle. And they decided to rise up and to fight them. So they, they were crushed by the German protective forces, which is the, what do you call it again? Stut Truppe or something like that, yeah. <laughs> In what was known as the first genocide of the 20th century. At what is known as the Battle of Hamakari, the Germans encycled the unsuspected of a Herero people they then fired the first bullet at the peaceful community. As unprepared as they, were, as they were, my people fought the Germans with everything at their disposal. What the ruthless von Trotter thought it was a quick engagement with the mighty of a Herero, and that, and that he will finish it off before he had his breakfast, turned out to be a fierce fight. And he never had that breakfast. For years, the Ovaro fought the Germans bravely. Von Trotter had no choice but to order more enforcement, which were shipped, which were shipped in from this very city, Hamburg. After a long and exhausting battle, the Ovaro fled in the direction of Omaheke Desert as it was the only opening left by the Germans. What the Germans did was they encycled 
the, 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 the village, and they only left an opening that led to the desert because they knew eventually when they had a flu, uh, will, um, flee, they will only flee through that uh, opening and they will go into the Omaheke region, uh, Omaheke desert, where they are not going to survive. Okay. Um, knowing that, they still chased them. They knew that they were going to suffer from starvation, from thirst, and so on, but they still continued to, to chase them. And a lot happened during that chase. To mention but a few, women were raped. And they were not just taken into the bushes and raped. They were raped in front of their families, in front of their husbands, their children. Dried tweets were put around those who could not run any further because of the starvation and, and, and exhaustion. And these dried tweets were set, al, uh, aside, were, set al, were set on fire, sorry. <laughs> were set on fire with people who are still alive in it. So they burned the twigs around the people and they were left there to die. Another thing is that um, while they were running, and I'm talking about hundreds of kilometers here. It's not just from one town to another, but it was hundreds of kilometers from the area of Waterberg into the Omaheke region. And these were people who were hungry, who didn't find any food, who were exhausted with the German soldiers behind them. So this forced the fathers or the men in the, among the people to actually take babies from their mothers because they felt the babies were slowing them down. So they took the babies from their mothers pretending to help the mothers carry the babies. And then they just turned around the bushes and they killed the babies because they felt that if they keep on with the babies, the Germans will come and finish the nation off. And all that, you can imagine when the father killed their own children for the survival of the nation. And they did that so that we can be here in Hamburg and tell you these stories. Many were left behind, including women and children who could not go any further. They were left behind and scattered all over the place and they were actually a feast to the vultures and the hyenas. The vultures were actually flying or encircling them, waiting for them to breathe their last breath in order for them to devour them. The water wells that they knew so well in the area were all poisoned by the cruel Germans. And this resulted in people, when, when they come to a water well and they try to drink the water, because of the poison, their tummies were bloated and many of them died. And that also included the, the little cattle that they had, that they were also moving with them. The Germans' cruelty knew no boundaries because they even raped the corpses. Oh yes, they did. On reaching Odombudo Vidimba, where the infamous extermination order was issued by von Trotter, they once again came across poisoned water holes and many were rounded off there. Now, Odombudo in Dimba, they, they gathered at a, it's like a small village, right? And there they hanged the men and women, and they were also hanged naked in front of their wives and so on. While the Germans were eating and drinking all jolly, as if they are not killing people. In one incident, that is also very painful to me. The German soldiers were bored. So they wanted to play ball. And since they did not have a ball, 
they grabbed a baby from the mother's arms and they started throwing the baby uh, around amongst them, like a ball. And when they got tired of it, one of the soldiers threw the baby high in the air and caught the baby with a bayonet while the mother was sitting there looking on. So you can imagine the pain that was caused by that to the mother. Many of the surviving of Herero fled to neighboring countries, such as the present-day Botswana, Togo, Cameroon, and South Africa. Those who remained were rounded off and packed in cattle trucks, sardine style. You know how sardines are packed in a tin? And taken to concentration camps all over the country, where they were further exposed to hard labor, harsh weather conditions, diseases, and more rapes. In these death camps, they were starved. They, they only got a few grains of rice a day. So the, the, the grains of rice were actually counted. So you got five. That was your ration for the day. This is uncooked uh, rice grains. It was also in the death camps where they were made to boil the heads of their loved ones, be it your husband, your child, your uncle, or whoever, in, for these skulls to be prepared for what they call scientific experiment by the racist Dr. Fitcher. We are still waiting just to prove, just to prove that the black race was inferior to the Germans. And we are still waiting for those tests, or the results of the test. It was never revealed. So maybe they found out that after all, the blacks are superior to the Germans. The atro uh, atrocities and humiliating treatment the Germans caused to my people in the name of creating a pure and superior German race in a country that is not even theirs is beyond comprehension and cannot be summed up in a single presentation. So many happened there. Uh, now I would like to show you some of the pictures that I was talking about. I don't know whether I will be able to do this. Oh, yeah, right. Can you see it? The first picture there on, the le on your right are the people who are hanged. Come again. On the left, okay. On the left, you can see people hang, uh, who are hanged there naked. The second one is when they were rounded off, put in cattle trucks to be transported to the concentration camps all over the country. The next two at the bottom are the concentration camps. You know, you can see how packed they were. One of those concentration camps was in Lutretz. And there, if some people got sick or if they see that you are weak and you cannot work for them anymore, you were thrown into the sea for the uh, sharks to eat you up. Okay, on the next slide, You can see yesterday, uh, some of the speakers, I think it's my chairperson, Ms. Mwinyangwe, were talking about skeleton. People were stuffed. And you can see the bones there. People are just bones and skin. But these brave women and men survived, and they gave birth to us. They survived and fled to the neighboring countries on foot, hungry, exhausted, but they had only one thing in mind, and it's the survival of their people. At the one at the bottom there, you can see German soldiers packing the skulls into boxes to be shipped to Germany. My next slide is showing the skeletons again, 
or no, <laughs> or the people who look like skeletons. They are walking skeletons. And the other one, you can also see the many people who are, who are hanged there. And these people were hanged in front of their families, wives, and so on, as I earlier mentioned. I will go on to the next slide, and that is the various consequences of genocide to the present. The losses. We have lost everything that we owned. We have lost lives. We have lost cattle. We have lost our land, grazing land. We have lost precious artifacts, to mention but a few. And we lost all these things without compensation. Skulls, skeleton which belong to us and should find a resting place in the country of their birth are still kept in German museums. Those who perished at the hands of the perpetrators never got a funeral, a burial, which is a very important ritual in our culture. So it is still painful to know that skulls and skeleton of our ancestors are still being kept in foreign countries. And that is a continuous insult to us by the arrogant German, or German, yeah, Germans. Those who survived the genocide had to live with the trauma and after effects of the genocide from generation to generation. It was mentioned yesterday as well that there is this uh, transgenerational trauma. Many of my generations were brought up by survivors of the genocide, and the emotional and psychological trauma thereof has been transferred to us, today's gen uh, generation. And I can actually speak of personal experience. I was brought up by my great-grandmother. You might be wondering why would a baby be brought by a great-grandmother? I never knew my grandmother. Maybe she died before my time. My mother went into exile when I was two years old. My father was a political prisoner, and he was held at Robben Island in South Africa for many years. So the only person who was left to look after me was my great-grandmother, who survived the genocide. During the genocide, she was about 12, 13, 14 years old. She had lost all her family. She had lost everything that they had. And um, even though I was too young maybe for her to tell me her story, I always found her sitting on the side of the house, staring towards the water back mountain where they, the, they used to live, and you would just see tears running down her, her cheeks. And wherever you ask her, Mama, what's wrong? She would just chase me away. And uh, she died without me know, even knowing about the genocide. It's only as I, grew, as I was growing up that I came to realize, no, my grandmother, my great-grandmother was actually 12, 13 years old during those years. And that is what might have caused her to be so quiet and to cry all by herself. My wish is, I wish I could wake her up from her grave and ask her so many questions so that you could tell me firsthand what happened during those years. Was she one of the, these people who were raped, the women who were raped, who were mistreated, I would really love to know that. But that is impossible because she's long gone. Our ancestors and the generations thereafter never received any assistance to help with the healing. Today, we are in a minority with, and have no political power in the country of our birth. Now, to those who do not know, the political setup in Namibia, our political parties are based on ethnicity. 
So if you are in a minority, there is no way that you will come to power that you make any impact by making the right decisions for your people. So we have the northerners, which we call the Ovambo people, the Swapo people, who are the majority in our country and who have ruled the country since independence. So they are in power and they decide or they wouldn't even listen to the minority groups. And I believe that because of the genocide, that's why we are in the minority in our own country. We live in poverty. Our land is still in the hands of the descendants of those who stole it from us. The people who have land in Namibia now, especially the white community, they did not work hard for that land. They inherited the land from their forefathers. And they just continue to get richer and richer, while the actual owners of the land live in poverty. Our brothers and sisters in the diaspora have lost everything. They have lost their culture. They have lost their land. They even lost their language. They are in foreign countries. They cannot speak their mother tongue. They had to adopt to the living standard of those uh, foreigners. Today, we in Namibia, the OGF, have to travel thousands of miles to reach out to those in the diaspora in trying to keep them abreast with their counterparts back home and to quench their thirst for the cultural rituals of their forebearers. For the Ovaherero and Nama people to exist today is a miracle and an act of bravery from those who survived the brutality of the racist Germans. We, the descendants, will keep the torch burning until restorative justice for the blood of our people is gained. They can try to silence us, but we shall overcome. The necessity of the, of the various forms of reparation. Germany must restore, repair the dignity and pride of the Ovaherero and Nama people by acknowledging the genocide through an apology to the descendants of those they wronged. Now I want to look at reparation modalities. We have restitution, which means you have to repair a people and take them back to, to the life that they had, to everything that they had. And we want Germany to do that. The compensation part. A lot had been saying, uh, said about compensation, about the reparations and so on. And from some corners, it is also being said that we want individual money for the Herero and Nama. That is a lie. We don't want individual money. And as um, the panelists from yesterday also said, reparation is not only about money. Who told the Germans that we want money even? We might not even request them to give us money. There are so many thing, aspects to re repairing a people, a nation. So I don't know why people keep thinking that maybe because we are black or because we are from Africa, we would not want anything but money but we are more smarter than that. Thank Satis you very Satisfaction. I'm not done yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Satisfaction. Whenever we are allowed to sit at the table with the Germans, we do not want the Germans to tell us what to do. We want to tell the Germans what we want to do. And we have to get satisfaction from that. Guaranteed of non-repetition, of course. That is very important. And we, I'm not just talking about Namibia here. I'm talking about all over the country. We have to fight and make sure that genocide is not repeated anywhere 
in the world. Scholars also argue that reparations had two parts to it. You have internal reparation, you have external reparation. The internal reparation, we are there already. Through the memorialization of our very important sites where our ancestors have died, we have annual commemorations of those days and those places. We have many of them. That to us is part of self-reparation. It's part of repairing our souls and accepting that these things have happened. Now let's go the next step. And the next step is the external reparation. And external reparation is what we demand from Germany. Okay. As we said, or as our motto says, nothing about us without us. Anything that is about us without us is against us. That is our motto. And we, the government cannot negotiate on our behalf. I know that you have heard that in the committees of the negotiating teams of the government, of the Namibian government, there are hereros and namas also. Those are sellouts. They are selling the blood of our ancestors. They are on government payroll. They are protecting the interest of the government. They are not protecting the interest of the victim communities. And that's why we want to sit at that table with the Germans and negotiate on our own behalf without anyone talking for us as if we, are, we don't have minds or something. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kambanda, for your really sad and also, in the end, empowering words. Um, I would like to introduce to you Paul Thomas. Sorry. Is it okay? Okay. I'd like to introduce to you Paul Thomas. He's the secretary of the NAMA Genocide Technical Committee. And I think he's, I'm sure he's the youngest on the panel today, with 29 years. Uh, he is a direct descendant of the victims of genocide as well. And he's a legal student at the University of Namibia at Windhoek. But in his time left for, um, left not studying, he's a leader in the youth movement uh, for land. Uh, he's been this for, for several years and he's also a leader in the landless people's movement. We will dwell on this later on as well, but now I would invite, like to invite him to hold his presentation. Thanks. Hello. Yes. <laughs> uh, first of all, um, you have heard what is my background. I'm quite a very young boy, uh, being sandwiched today by two <laughs> two women. Um, I want to give a, a background. Um, I thought it, it will be it would have been very important today to give uh, some background to um, the uh, uh, Namibian history. Also for, for the benefit of, because um, I, I see since yesterday, they, they are a lot of um, young university students and also um, for the German people who do not have such insight to the Namibian history. Uh, let me begin by saying that the rebuilding of Namibia is an equal 
amongst nations is a real term and not a lip service. So will be concerned for both the Namibian and the German peoples. This is one world who deserves all our best efforts to preserve her for all of us. If we destroy any part of it, no matter if it is 6,000 miles away, we are destroying part of our Heimat. The Namibian people may not blame the German people for the exploration and partially successful extermination in Namibia. We are blaming the German Reich in the same way that we Namibian people cannot be blamed for the crimes against humanity committed by the Swabo in exile and the brutalization of Caprivians, Bushmans, and the Namibians generally since 1990. However, the German state has left a trail of devastation behind in Namibia, which is continuing today due to the fact that nothing has been done from the German regime side, German regime side to own up its responsibility and to do its part to reconstruct a savage nation. I quote the late Chief Friedrichs, who said, my people are suffering cultural genocide. The social economic disintegration of the affected communities in the south of Namibia. The Namibian and the German regimes, the entire talks in, the Namibian, in Namibia between the two regimes is a mockery and a circus for the following reasons. Both the states are success, successor states. The Namibian state is a successor of the two colonial regimes. The German state is a successor of the German Reich. The Namibian state carries the liability of mass murders of the Namibians, but it has lost control of the former colony, which is now under the control of the Namibian state. The Namibian state carries the liability to restore private property of the nations illegally dispossessed. Private property, um, maybe I should just uh, underline the word private property, because uh, we, quietly we have a, a very liberal, I should, mean, I should say a liberal um, constitution. Uh, Namibian constitution is quietly a liberal uh, constitution. So um, with the whole debate around the, the land issue currently, uh, it has been perceived as that um, land is protected by the provisions in the Namibian constitution as per its private property. But the land has been a private property since the invasion of, uh, of the German uh, Reich. It, 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 was private, it was a private property of these two communities, respectively the, the Nama and the Herero. It carries a liability in terms of its successor obligations in the national law and the constitutional provisions of the protection of private property. As if in a very bad joke, the Namibian regime now pretends to protest with the dispossessed and brutalized peoples, while it stands co-responsible for the restoration and brutalized peoples. What for the what is further an insult is that the Namibian regime, which has committed mass murders against the thousands of the Namibians, in the, is the negotiator solely recognized by the German government, which is to us unacceptable. What are the effects? The effects of the scenery of the Namibian and the German regimes is that the problem will be perpetuated until the Namibian people resolve issues themselves. The fact of the matter is that the dispossessed properties are in Namibia. The land is in Namibia and not in Germany. And, uh, and this, is what, this is what the uh, German government tries to ignore and tries to uh, think they can run away. The private property, which is the land, and 
we all know that the, the, the genocide was, the, the land was, it was the reason why the Germans invaded, um, the German Reich invaded the uh, Namibia, the former, former Southwest Africa. It became a permanent problem between Namibia regime, Namibian regime and the landowners on the one hand and the dispossessed people on the other hand. As early as 1992, Ms. Ida Hoffmann proposed the engagement between German-speaking Namibians and the, Nama, and the Nama Herero nations to maturely and responsibly discuss burning and fundamental issues. The two sides will come with their expectations and discuss the matter as compatriots for the most mutually bene beneficial solution, eye to eye. In, nine, in 2017, the German government released a proposal to target what they called the affected communities. We note elements of the proposal such as training, education, development of infrastructure, but we need to investigate in discussion and agreement with the people on, on the actual scope and extent of needs. We cannot accept thumb sucking of the German regime. We disagree with the high handed top down, top bottom, top bottom approach, which ignores the central issues, namely what the dispossessed want. We reject the proposal of a perpetuated of FIB scheming, such as the black empowerment through which the Namibian state is now bankrupt and seeks for a bailout from the German government and from the German taxpayers. We reject the idea of reparation funds shall be used for further enrichment of the landowners with no consideration of stolen lands and, and user fracked, of course, and use of rock. Of course, an evaluation and estimation of contribution of land owners shall be an integral part of a reasonable consideration in the deliberations of how land reform in Namibia will be accepted by the Namibian people in those two affected communities. We insist on the approach taken by Ms. Ida Hoffman as early as 1992. In fact, the German government's position is one, again, bent to ignore international law and the Namibian constitution in this regard. Nevertheless, we will take the proposal as bona fide and put our own proposal in which being prepared alongside. We firstly discuss our proposal with the communities and the people in general. Those are the affected communities. At the same time, we will discuss with our German partners in Germany. In this way, we hope to develop a wide accepted program as a final, final proposal in reply to the German state's proposal. In conclusion, the Nama Genocide Technical Committee and the delegates extend our appreciation to our German sisters and brothers for the selfless assistance and solidarity they have extended to the Namibian people to the present time. I thank you. Thank you very much, Paul Thomas. I would like to introduce to you our third speaker, which is uh, who is Vipuka Kawari. Um, she was born in the same town, as I understand, as Kambanda in Ukakarara, in the Waterberg district in Southwest Africa, currently in Namibia. Um, but different uh, to Kambanda, she migrated to the United States as a student via a United Nations scholarship for South Africans at the height of the apartheid era. Vipuka graduated from the City College of New York with a bachelor's degree in nursing and holds a master's degree in nursing science 
from the Lehman College. Vipuka's career started at the NYU, where she served in various roles. She has spent 27 years at the NYP, uh, moving up the ranks from staff nurse in the adult um, department to her current role as a director of nursing in the pediatric emergency in the UB OB Women's Services at Sloan Hospital for Women. Vipuka is responsible for leadership and operational management there and is improving the patient, patient's experience for the divisions. Vipuka is also active in the movement for restorative justice as a co-founder of the Association of the Overhead Edo Genocide in the USA, which is one of the NGOs present here, called AOG. She has presented on various occasions on genocide in various settings, including to parliamentarians in Berlin. Vipuka is also the co-author of numerous health-related articles and is a fellow at the New York Academy of Medicine in the evidence-based research section. Her grandmother was the child of a German settler. Thank you. You've heard a lot in the past three days, um, so we're just going to get going. And over the past 24 hours, I think you've heard a lot about our courses. So we're just going to get started and just let us just all agree with the scholars and all the legal experts, the horrors of 1904 to 1908, to which the overhead error and the Nama peoples were subjected to, falls within the definition, the classic definition of genocide. Therefore, the slaughter of the overhead error and the Nama people should be acknowledged as the first genocide of the 20th century. <laughs> Germany have chosen to use euphemisms, such as unfortunate history, colonial atrocities, to undermine their reality. German colonial authorities knowingly and intentionally design a policy of total uh, annihilation. There is no question that the genocide, that the genocide of the Avahero and the Nama constitute a grave injustice in the crimes against humanity. The campaign was well planned and the, brutally carried out to wipe out the Ovaherero and the Nama peoples from their land. The large tracts of fertile land and countless livestock was taken away without any compensation by the German colonists, with explicit consent of the German colonial authority. The sweeping expropriation of land of the Ovaherero was tantamount to denying them of their cultural and spiritual identities. Many who survived the initial slaughter were raped, brutalized, sent to notorious concentration camps such as Chalk Island, where many of them have died, uh, as shown by Kambanda in the previous presentation. So what we really want I ask that you, the citizens of this great state, Germany, um, work with your government to stop the denialism and the racist disdain towards our people. Recognize that the genocide of 1904-1908 was genocide through a Buddhist resolution and public statement by your German chancellor. Respect and recognize our traditional leaders. They were here before, they will be here till the end. The genocide totally destroyed our culture, our language. Some of my family for, uh, sought refuge in Cameroon. I have brothers born in Botswana. Some are in South Africa. If I could just put it in perspective, we drove from the Kalahari, from Aminus, to Lepelale this past uh, summer, or oh, last fall. 
it took us 15 hours by car on a tar road to get there. They walked. Most of them died. Uh, you all know that the culture and um, language is essential to human survival and interactions. Germany must comprehend and really recognize that transgenerational psychological trauma, social, cultural, and political impact on the people uh, in Namibia and in the diaspora. The genocide justice is not about the Namibian government. The Herero and the Nama peoples lost their land and tangible, tangible properties. We all know that in 2007 and 2008, there was an expedition right here in Germany in Stuttgart where the family Bible that once belonged to Hendrik Bedboy was displayed. Where is it? Doesn't the family deserve that? It's family treasure. We need it back. Um, uh, we saw on Friday the skull of the Herero that is sitting somewhere. I'll call it the basement because I don't really know where it's sitting. We don't display our dead. We, we bury them. We want them back. Secondly, we want an apology. Many of you have asked what the apology should look like or would look like. Now, this is jumping. Okay. Germany must issue an apology in good faith, directed directly to the Ovaherero and Nama people for the genocide that they have committed and carried out under the leadership of the mighty Kaiser and General von Trotter. Additionally, we demand public denunciation and repudiation of von Trotter's extermination orders of 1904 to 1905 against the Ovaherero people. I expect that a deep apology, sincere enough, rendered by the sovereign of the offending state, in this case Germany, be the central prerequisite to our reconciliation. The days of shame are really over. It's time that Germany publicly apologize for their heinous act in the events that occurred in 1904 and 1908. I plead before you, the citizens of Germany, to lobby your senators, your government, to partner with us and demand a genuine and unambiguous apology from your Bundestag. We are not here to re really recreate the wheel. As you could see in the picture above, that's uh, really to follow in the footsteps of your former chancellor, Willy Brandt, here in 1970, when he was facing or offering his, showing his forgiveness and what the past looked like when he was apologizing for the Jews. Philosophically, the essential argument is the heteros were subjected to uncompensated, uh, uncompensated labor, coerced into working on German farms, post-war, women were building railroads, while others perished in inhumane conditions. This exploitive theft spread the economic growth that we see here in the great city of Hamburg and it really impacted the development of the political society and the culture here in Germany. It is crucial for the German government to return the land, to compensate the Ovaherero people and the Nama people for their land, their cattle, their personal artifacts stolen before and after the genocide. For many years, our requests for reparations have gone unnoticed. The German leaders should follow the footsteps of their former chancellor, um, Konrad Adenauer, who was instrumental 
during the, for the pain, to authorize the payment of the reparations for the Jewish victims of the Nazi Holocaust. We need you to include the Namas and the overheaded people in the conversations. We need you to return the land. Uh, currently, I live in Aminius in the Omaheke Desert where there's very little water, where our people were left to die. The Namibian government have not supported the demand for reparations. One can only believe that the two governments enjoy a friendly relationship, and perhaps these demands are coming from primarily from the Hereros and the Namas, and not necessarily the majority of the national level of the government. We're not asking for foreign aid, handouts from the German government. Instead, we're demanding compensation and restoration for the land that was stolen. Some of you may wonder, why is this important to me? I am not a great granddaughter. I am a granddaughter of a German soldier and a hetero woman who was newly wed, going with her love, beloved husband to Tsumep to find a better life. On her way, she was taken away from her husband. She was raped. She was now became property of this German man and she gave birth to two children. One, the first one, my grandmother, who looked, some of you might call you my distant cousins, figuratively white. And her name was Kamundu Shaita. That means that this thing that came out of you is not a human being, because they didn't know what that was. I look around this room and I see you, my distant cousin, and I ask you, and I plead with you to demand your government to return our people, our remains, our objects, demand inclusion of the Obaherero and the Nama people. Let me remind everyone here, the words of my patron, Festus Munjwa, that the Obaherero and the Nama people will not stop in this issue until they are brought to the table. And this will continue infinitum. Thank you. Thank you, Vipuka. Thank you, Kambana and Paul, for your presentations. Um, as some people just start to, to look deeper into the complex situation in Namibia or between Germany and Namibia. Uh, and as I think we've got a kind of educational task as well to make them understand what's going on, I would like to draw on some points you already mentioned. Um, Kambanda, you talked about why it is, this, it is um, not acceptable for the communities, for the Nama and Herero communities, to be represented by a government team, even if it includes people from the Herero, some people from the Herero and from the Nama communities. Uh, you said your opinion on this already, but I would like to ask Paul and Vipuka to maybe to dwell on this a little bit more and comment upon on this. Thanks. Yes, um, Kosler, um, it, it has been already alluded to by um, Gambanda. Why, what is our f strong feeling against those who, the so-called Nama and Herero people that are presenting, trying to present and speak on behalf of the of the Nama and Herero. Um, these people are puppets of the, of the government. Um, they have individual interests in um, 
that that is that is simply the 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 reason why we strongly feel that we cannot be represented and we cannot accept them as our representatives. The way, the way in which our government have reacted to the issue of resolution or reconciliation or genocide does not represent us, period. They have not called upon us. They have not sought any advice from us. Therefore, it does not represent us. So they cannot represent us until we are there with our own chiefs or traditional leaders who would represent us. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a second uh, subject um, um, that Paul was touching on, uh, and he's deeply involved in the movement for land rights. Um, and I would uh, dwell on, like to dwell on this as well a little bit. Um, the land question seems to be one of the main uh, questions, uns unsolved questions in, in Namibia and for you, for the Namantereto communities especially as you were expropriated by the, completely expropriated by the German government uh, during the genocide. Um, Paul said his opinion on this already, um, so I would like to ask Kambanda and uh, Vipuka as well if they want to add something, and I have a special reason for, for this, um, or a side aspect of this is um, that Maybe you can comment upon also upon the background of what is going on in South Africa at the moment, where there is there are strong debates about the well expropriation of uh, white farmers' uh, land, and how do you think could it uh, influence the situation in Namibia? What do you expect by this? And there's a second point I I would uh, like to know more from you. Uh, why do you think um, these uh, proposals by the German government, one-sided proposals, um, to deal with the issue of genocide in the framework of developmental projects is so unacceptable for you? Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we, we have two issues of land in Namibia. We have ancestral land that belong to the Ovaharo and Nama people. And then we have land that was also lost to other tribes through colonialism and so on. We are concentrated, concentrating more on the ancestral land. Now, at the, shortly after independence, there was a land conference. And um, this land conference was supposed to have solved the land issue. But compromises were made. And uh, one wonders why a political party who claimed to have fought for the liberation of the country based on land would come to a conference and <laughs> and just turn, turn round, you know, and um, do what they have not been preaching. Because they compromise that um, the land in Namibia will not be given to the landless. Uh, they will buy farms from the white uh, farmers, and then they will uh, redistribute these farmers to to the landless people. Now what happened is, that is now called the resettlement program. Now what happened is that they are resettling, no, I don't even want to say resettling, they are settling people who never lost land onto this farm that the government buys. And the people who lost ancestral land are left out. These farms, maybe 80% or whatever of them are given to the northerners, people who were in the north who were not touched by the genocide, who never lost land there. So they leave, it, they leave their land up north 
and they get settled inland. But those who lost the land who should be resettled, they, they are not getting that chance because they are in the minority groups. They belong to the minority. The, the, the government is the majority and they do what they please. So usually we just have to, to accept it because there's not much that we can do. Um, to go to your second, what was the second one again? Yeah, I was, <laughs> it was uh, dwelling on um, the, what is going on in South Africa at the moment and then also the question of Yeah, of course, um, in South Africa they have decided to take land from the white farmers without compensation. The same style that happened in Zimbabwe. Now, we don't want that to happen in Namibia. We don't want a, a war in Namibia. We know the consequences of war, so we don't want to go through that. So the best way is, see, we, have, we had farms in, in Namibia belonging to Germans who are here who only use it for hunting during the hunting season. So all these farms are not being used. They only go there in June, July to go and hunt, and then they come back to Germany. They have vast lands, and most of these farms have got Herero names. That shows that they belong to the over Herero people. But why can't they compromise? Why can't they come to the table and say, okay, fine, I have five farms. I'm prepared to give you three, and I will keep the two, because the farms were taken from us anyway. Why can't they do that? Why do they feel that they deserve those farms and uh, that they worked hard for it? It's what I mentioned earlier, which are those people who are on the farm did not work hard for the land because it was never theirs. They inherited from their ancestors who stole it from us. So we don't want the situation in, in, in South Africa and Zimbabwe to, to happen in Namibia, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. If we are not being hurt, we will get tired. Thank you, Commander. So land, why is land important? Why are we even talking about land? Land is the wealth that we've had. So my great, my grandparents who grew up in Waterberg, that was the rainy area, and it was part of the Ovaherero land. You can't take what was known as Ovaherero land and give it to others. So what our government is doing is they know it's wealth. This is where we will have our animals, our livestock. They will thrive. And they're bringing people from other places who are not necessarily herders. And now they're renting these farms or land to the Ovaherero people who have nowhere to go to in our own country. So I think that's something that when you're taking wealth away from people, you're colonizing them with that type of poverty and it really has to stop. We need our land back, just give back Ovaherero land to the Ovaherero people. Thank you. It is um, more than a year ago that uh, the Ovaherero and Nama communities and um, Vera Katu from as a U.S. citizen and Herero uh, opened or went to court in New York. And we haven't talked about this very much uh, until now during the conference. I think it is a subject uh, which should be talked about as well. Um, and I would be pleased if you would be willing to comment upon this as well. I'm not only asking Vipuka because uh, well, she's very close to the place where it takes place in New York, but also, of course, our other guests um, to comment upon this and uh, to, to give an insight for a public who's maybe not so deep into this uh, also very complex and I, I for, my, for my part, think very difficult to understand legal subjects. So I'm not a lawyer, 
do not know anything about legal terms, but I do know that in collaboration with our traditional chiefs, uh, and because of the frustrations of our government, are not really hearing what we wanted to do with uh, the genocide. As American citizens, we use our court systems, our legal systems. And uh, we, there's a lawyer, uh, Kenneth Megalian, that everyone is aware of. And the, we've had three hearings now in New York, and we're pending another hearing. Now that the state of Germany have come to the table, they actually showed up in court in the last hearing. And um, as far as I'm concerned, it has taken more than 114 years um, that the German government have not acknowledged what has taken place during the 1904 to 1908 and afterwards. Um, so it's time that the legal system take place. But I will defer this question to Skara, who's uh, a legal expert and potentially can speak to into the terms that may be more comprehensible to the to you guys. Do we have a microphone for Skara? Sorry about not telling you beforehand. Thanks. Who? To Skara. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm going to try and be as simple as possible in terms of the case. The answer is yes, we have filed a lawsuit on the basis of a class action, meaning simply a class, a class action allows you to represent that particular community wherever it might find itself. A good example would be a case that took place in South Africa some times back. This case was to do with, mind you, in South Africa, health and uh, housing provision is a right, but not a privilege. So interest organizations like yourselves, they took the South African government to court during Thabo Mbeki's time, because in Mbeki, even though he's an economist, he, has, he had this funny way of looking at science as well, and he argued that HIV AIDS does not cause AIDS and he refused to provide these services to these communities that were affected. So um, human rights organizations, they under the class action example, they took the South African government to court and they were successful in terms of forcing Thabo Mbeki and his government to provide services like health services and housing. So on those basis also, we, we filed this case under the, law, uh, the class action lawsuit but in the final analysis, Germany was reluctant to appear in court. But you would appreciate the fact that if you are someone to court to answer to any, any charge or lawsuit, if you don't appear on a third occasion, the complainant is entitled to apply for what they call a default judgment. And I think they foresaw that and they sent a representative the last time who appeared in court. And I would say they were very interesting, a bit arrogant because they, he wrote an email to, our, to our, our legal representative saying he must admit to him filing for dismissal on the basis of um, jurisdiction, but actually he was brought back to his senses because the judge told them that they must respect her court. She's a, a lady judge. They must respect her court and actually follow the procedures. And I think the, the German representative now, they went back to follow the, the right procedures and we are expecting to go back to New York for further engagement. But actually, that would tell you that actually this process is ongoing. But if I may share with you, one of the things we are looking at is to bring the German government to census, even to include us in negotiations because on repeated occasions, uh, the paramount chief of the Wahere get asked about even the president of Namibia, actually he invited him at some point and he has asked him about the court case in America and the answer is to, for instance, I think the question was to do with if I were to, bro to bring you at the negotiating table, what are you going to do with the case in America? And the answer was simple. We will keep this case in abeyance 
go and negotiate because actually all the legal systems they allow you to go and negotiate if you are not happy you go back to to the courts or if you reach an agreement that agreement must be taken to court and be you know in those as, as a court as a court order and that is some of the things we're looking at but in a nutshell the case is ongoing it's forthcoming i think it was supposed to be somewhere in on the 3rd of may but i understand it might be extended further <laughs> But this is a case that, to me, is very interesting in the sense that I think it will help actually bring Germany to their rightful senses, senses that is. And one argument which I think the, the lawyers that are representing Germany is to say, why didn't we, as the victim communities, explore the avenues here, particularly courts here in Germany? Because Germany, at some point, they were saying we happen to be their their subject and meaning we do have jurisdiction to bring, you know, certain cases here in Germany. But you would, uh, for your own, I think you have a better guess to say why we would not actually think of a court in, in Germany. We have our own reservations. The other thing is that the charade that is between the Namibian government and the German government, presently what they are doing, because they have excluded the victim communities. But if you look at international laws, they are very clear. And for instance, if you look at uh, um, principles and guidelines on the right of the victims of heinous crimes like genocide, it says the victims themselves must be at the negotiating table. But Germany and the Namibian government, they are, they are ignoring that. And there was this question of the South African land question right now, if I may. Um, the resolution that was passed recently, it says now the South African government will move over towards expropriating land without compensation. Actually, it doesn't say against the whites only. I want to also touch on that because even the, the chief of the Zulus was concerned about that uh, concept because he strongly feels they might be targeted by government in terms of expropriation of land without compensation. When we go back on the question of land, particularly to Namibia, uh, I would like to echo my elder brother Ngondika Matuka yesterday. We, we, we don't harbor any hatred against the, the Germans, particularly the, the Namibian-speaking Germans or the Namibians of German origin. We talk to them and we have not, like Ambanda was saying, we have not gone to the extent of actually going the Zimbabwean style of you know, taking this land back. We want both governments, particularly the German government, to realize that it had got its own people. There was this question of visas. For me to come here, I need a visa. But my German colleague, Namibian resident, or Namibian citizen of German origin, they don't need a visa to come to Germany. And even Germans from here, if they want to go to Namibia, I can assure you, without any hassle, they can just board into a plane and go to Namibia. At the airports, they are accorded the, the best privileges that you can think of. But guess what? When I come to Germany, black as I am, I'm questioned, I'm suspected of some ills that I'm, I'll be bringing to Germany. And these are the things that we are saying. The German government as well as the Namibian government must come to their senses and address some of these issues. Sometimes I argue you know, openly when I look at the privileges that are enjoyed by uh, fellow African uh, citizens that were colonized, for instance, by France through assimilation. You all know what happens with them. You look at your countries like Morocco vis-a-vis -vis France. I think they, they have certain privileges that they're enjoying, but you can't say the same when it comes to the Namibians. I'm talking about the whole of Namibia because as Hereros, we are not that blind to say that must be extended only to the Nama and the Herero speaking communities, but we would want to see that be enjoyed by all Namibians, even in terms of removing this thing of a visa. Thank you. Um, now we have talked a bit about the present situation, the difficult situation, especially for the Nama and Herero communities. And um, I would like to shift the subject a little bit and to look back again. Um, 
not only to to yesterday uh, I was in a positive way uh, surprised what happened uh, I didn't expect um, the city the free city and, and Hanseatic city of Hamburg as a federal state um, of our Republic here to apologize uh, I must confess I didn't see this possibility before this um, as much as I and probably most of us welcome this. Um, I, I have a feeling that we often, if this news comes, uh, forget about what led to this decision. Um, of course, politicians have a tendency to sell decisions as their own, you know, the, the fruits of their own work. Um, and that's why I would like to draw uh, the clock a bit back um, and to, to dwell upon the past, uh, the initiatives not only of the Namantedera community in Namibia for 25 years or maybe, so to say, until uh, for, for the last more than 100 years, um, but especially the initiatives uh, of the communities in Germany uh, which were um, coming before this decision of Hamburg to apologize. And um, I'm, of course, much more fluent on knowing about what, is, what was going on in, in Berlin. So I would like to invite uh, Vipuka maybe to tell uh, a little bit on how this idea of having transnational congresses in Germany, we've got the second now, I talked a bit about the first one which we organized in Berlin in 2016 but there was a prehistory of this as well and um, as I was mentioned yesterday as one of the organizers I would like to you know pass on the ball to and, and make clear who were the real organizers and having this idea so we maybe you can add on this. So, um, in 2015, we joined our brothers and sisters in Berlin in October, and I think it was around Christian's birthday, not that we knew it was, and uh, we demonstrated on the National Reparations Day in front of the Bundestag. It was a rainy, rainy, I think it was a Wednesday or something like that. Um, there was no politician who came out to support us the citizens of Berlin in the area where we were didn't come out to support us. But we had great support from the local NGOs, which are, if I name one, I will leave one out, so I will just leave it at that. And um, there was outpouring support from the civil society, and um, we were really having, they opened that crack to start having a healthy dialogue with Germans and, of course, over Hereros at the time, and then the Namas who followed through as well. From that time, we set in, after being rained on, Jephta, Kavemui, Vera, myself, and Christian and Israel, we, and, of course, Boro, uh, we sat in a cafe just to get warm because it was so cold. And while we were sitting at this high table, we started having, just throwing ideas of what is next. We've done this, now what are we going to do next? From that, we birthed the idea of having the Transnational Congress on Genocide. And the first one took place last year in Berlin and was very successful, well received. I couldn't be more proud to say that the city of Hamburg really have extended that olive branch, and now we want to know what's next, where to. Um, so this will be left for the citizens here, and of course for the youth that, uh, that are overwhelmingly supporting us here, that we can't just leave it here. We need to do something more. What would that be? What would that look like? Who's going to be there? So I, with the help of Christian, the support from the people back home, this is something that is dear to us. We're very much um, vested in this, and we will need your help to continue the, uh, to keep this flame burning. Thank you.
Thank you, Vipuka, for um, um, giving this, uh, I think, the right direction or to correct this uh, uh, impression of uh, that, you know, um, NGOs here in Germany started the thing. Um, Paul and Kambanda, I, I know you for quite a while as well, and this is because you've been to Berlin as well. Mm, would you like to, to uh, talk a little bit about your impressions um, you got in Berlin, not so much um, on how you were received by the NGOs, but rather how you felt, you know, re received or not received by the government, the German government. Because, I mean, this, the idea of our panel is a little bit to, to open up the door, not to focus so much on Hamburg, as we already did here, and which is important, of course, be, because we are in, in Hamburg, but to, to talk about the national dimension of this and, and uh, how the German government is, you know, dealing with the subject, even when in the cases or when you come here to Germany being open for talks. Okay. Um, thank you. I can't remember an instance where we were received by the government. <laughs> Apart from Movasat, from the left party, who invited us to his office and we had a, a, a meeting there. And Movasat is one of the people who actually tabled a motion to open up talks on, on genocide, and that motion was thrown out. So he is our friend, and he's the only one who actually invited us there. As for the German government, um, they wouldn't receive us. I remember the, an instance where, was it last year, where we went to the exhibition, and um, our own ambassador was there, present, and he kind of got a shock to see us at the exhibition as well. And <laughs> yeah, and um, he, without expecting us there, he was actually telling untruths to the audience who were in the hall. And um, Esther actually stood up and gave the correct version of what the ambassador was saying, and he was very, very much embarrassed. And he actually, while he said that he was going to spend the evening there, he walked out after Esther had some words with him. So, <laughs> and I'm mentioning him because he, he's an extension of our government here, and also part of the German government here because he's ambassador here. That's why I mentioned him there. But any other instance where we were received by government, uh-uh. I can't remember, but the NGOs, they received us well. They, they help us in creating awareness or, or, or of our case. And as Wepuka asked, um, where will the next conference be? I would love it to be in Namibia. I would love you guys to come to Namibia and have a conference like this at the place where the genocide actually took place and where it is never mentioned, hardly mentioned. And um, maybe another thing that I can add is if you go to Namibia today, you would never believe that a genocide was committed there because we don't have any monuments. There is no sign of the Ovaherero and Nama actually dying in their thousands in the country of their birth. All you see is the German monuments, the German graves. Our people's graves are unmarked, but you will see that the Germans want to have monument on them and so on. So it will be great to have a conference such as this one back home and draw everybody. Yeah, thank you. Yes, um, yes, uh, Christian. Um, the German government, uh, as it has been doing, is still demonstrating its arrogance. Um, the German government, vis-à-vis -vis our Namibian government, um, as uh, Kambanda has said early on, um, I have been coming. This is my actually my second time, 
and there is no government, German government official that has um, uh, received us uh, or even have been willing to speak to us um, um, and just to also hear uh, our perspective here locally, in whether it's in Berlin or here in Hamburg. Um, I, will, I was just now sitting and uh, something came up in my mind. Um, and just for the, for the information of the local German people here in Hamburg and in Germany itself, um, the, your uh, representative who is representing um, the German government in Namibia, Christian Slager, a terrible, arrogant um, individual. Um, I would have. I would like to make a proposal to the Hamburg um, civil society, uh, our German friends here, to write a petition that really calls for the recall of of uh, Slacker, uh, since he is making reckless statements. Um, left, right, and center, which I think um, gives a very bad reflection about uh, the, the uh, German people here uh, in, 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 in Germany. So, um, in a nutshell, um, uh, really the government is not, uh, is not willing to, 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 to speak to us. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm, I'm looking out for um, Jonas or Tom. They might notice and, and note this uh, proposal uh, if, you, if you agree to, to take it into the resolution to demand something like uh, the withdrawal of the German ambassador to Namibia. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know how you think about it, but... Uh, we, should, we can discuss this later on as well, maybe, uh, but I think we should take it as a proposal by, uh, by the, at least by Thomas, uh, by Paul, Thomas, uh, and maybe also by the communities. Uh, so, um, I would like to add uh, two things. I, I know a moderator should not have an own presentation. <laughs> I make it very short, but um, as I as I was privileged to, to uh, be part of these uh, initiatives and activities when you were in Berlin and were with you all the time, uh, I remember two very moving um, moments uh, where I was totally disillusioned uh, by the willingness of the German government to treat the Herero and Nama leaders and the communities in a respectful manner. The one thing was when we handed in a petition to the um, Bundespräsident uh, Gauck at this time um, at the um, Schloss Bellevue, we, we wrote a letter to him for six weeks before that, so he had time to prepare. We wanted to hand in our petition to apologize and to, you know, repair the damage for the genocide. and. He was not even willing to let the delegation, which was headed by Paramanchi Fodokoro and Ida Hoffmann uh, for, for the NAMA, not even, they didn't even invite us to come in. They sent out a subaltern clerk to, to receive our petition. So standing outside of this castle and you know not being received was terrible for me and I, I think for for the delegation as well. Um, and, and there was a second moment when I was um, kind of shocked. Um, you talked about an exhibition, which was the small one we had have, still have as a permanent exhibition in Trepto. But there was a big one and, uh, um, um, concerning or on German colonialism in 2016 in the German Historical Museum in Berlin. And it was no accident that we had our first Congress at exactly the same weekend when this uh, exhibition was opened up. 
So we wrote a letter to the curators or to the director of the German Historical Museum saying that the Paramount Chief Furukoro would be here and the whole delegation of 50 people coming here by their own, on their own coast uh, to Germany. And uh, this exhibition uh, was dealing, of course, with the genocide. Uh, we said, well, this would be the opportunity to give the Paramount Chief uh, the right to have, uh, you know, a short speech and greeting the guests for the opening of the exhibition, which was well, uh, uh, um, many people were there, you know, maybe 500 or something. And the museum declined this uh, offer saying, uh, we may have an exhibition, but we are not political. So they excluded the Paramount Chief who was in Berlin and of course the communities, uh, the delegation said then we wouldn't go, wouldn't like to go to the opening of the exhibition. So we stood outside with the delegation uh, protesting against this exclusion. And you see 500 people um, belonging to the cultural establishment, the white cultural establishment of Berlin, rushing in and having a glass of, uh, you know, champagne. And outside uh, you see um, the victims of the genocide. This is, uh, was completely terrible for me to experience. I've never dreamt of that this would be possible in Germany, but it is, yeah. So. Um, I have a final question um, to Paul and, of course, to the other presenters as well. Uh, you are still a student, and uh, I would guess that half of our audience is in the age of uh, doing their studies here. I welcome this very much because it gives me hope for, for your course and our course. Um, and um, I think we can forget about um, white guys older than 50 years. I'm 49 now, uh, so I can say this. Um, but it's uh, very uh, important to, to, uh, to reach the uh, students um, and younger people. And this is our experience as well, doing guided tours. Most of the people coming are below the age of 30 years, very open for the subjects they've never heard about. So Paul, do you have any ideas how maybe as the students' movement here is very important for supporting this Congress and seems to be the main pillar of this movement, how this can be strengthened, their cause and their initiatives, and maybe there can be founded some kind of cooperation between the students in Namibia, in Windhoek, and the students in Hamburg, and I guess in Berlin as well, in the major university cities in Germany, uh, how we can, you know, support their coming together and uh, cooperating and having something like a civil society cooperation on this student's level. Yes, uh, Christian, uh, a very important question. Uh, let me uh, start off by saying the famous quote um, that says, Preventing the conflicts of tomorrow means changing the mindsets of youth today. And um, I think it's very important. Um, in 2016, when I was at the uh, first Congress, uh, there were youth also, uh, university youth, and which were in the, from the audience, uh, there were some questions coming in quietly. Many students in that audience only heard for the first time the genocide about the Namibian genocide. And as you have also alluded to early on, uh, the number that has grown, uh, I can also confess to it today um, the, in terms of the uh, attendance here in Germany and in Berlin. Um, it's very important that um, from, from this con Congress, we, uh, as the youth, uh, work out something, for instance, to have a, like um, Jeffta has mentioned it earlier on in the morning, um, sort of a, some kind of uh, exchange programs between Windhoek, 
in Hamburg, in Berlin, in Hamburg, in uh, most especially um, Nama in Herero Youth, uh, in the in the German Youth uh, students uh, to go and experience and learn some of the history, uh, not just us coming and telling them what has happened in in. Um, uh, in, during the 1904-1908 uh, yeah, genocide, but to visit some of the uh, some of the sites and have a practical uh, um, experience of of of, of um, the genocide that took place 140 years ago. So it it, it it's really a very important uh, process that uh, from um, after this uh, congress um, we we will. Um, going forward, um, uh, take it um, as a very serious um, uh, proposal. Yes. Um, Vipuka Kamanda, do you want to add something to this? Even if you're not a student anymore? <laughs> I think it's important that uh, to really appreciate the students' movements across the nations um, in the United States right now, there's the gun control legislation and it's led by the students. In South Africa in the 70s, it was the uprising, it was led by the students. I think we, it's important to underscore that to avoid being that second victim, it is the students' responsibility to hold the government to their sovereign responsibility of accepting what they have done wrong and making sure that they apologize, they acknowledge their wrongdoing, they find ways to educate the German public. We, they partner with the Namibian, the Ovahero and the Nama leaders to educate or to help have resources to educate about our genocide. But it is really, we depend on the students because this is the movement that, this is who's left. We're, we're, we're halfway done. So the future is really in the students' hands. Okay. Um, the final thing I would touch upon is uh, a proposal which was uh, brought forth um, to think about a kind of educational, cultural center focusing on the genocide in Namibia and maybe here as well. I know there's talk about some kind of memorial center, information center in the Berlin Senate already. So I'm very excited what will come out of this. Um, we heard that Hamburg will have the possibility to, uh, to have a, a center for African cultures, different African cultures, and for the black community here, and which might um, focus on the genocide as well, at least temporarily. Um, I th would like to hear your opinion on a danger I see as well with this. Um, as much as I would welcome this, and I think it is very important to carry on educational work, uh, having exhibitions, uh, cultural events, etc., related to the genocide, I remember that um, the German government, uh, Mr. Polens, has already brought forth proposals going in this direction. Even Heidemarie Vitorek Zoyl uh, initiated a kind of cultural center in uh, Namibia. Um, and it, is, it, seems to be, uh, it seems to appear as an easy way, way out of paying, you know, reparations and, and um, being, taking on full responsibility for the genocide to finance some kind of cultural center which, which is, uh, you know, as a substitute for this. So I see a kind of dilemma uh, as, as uh, educational work is important and as long as we cannot reach this final aim of reparation and full recognition, it is the only thing or the main thing maybe we can carry on. So it would be good to have such a center and then the danger of 
the government using it as the only thing they do. So what do you think upon this? Yeah, thank you, Christian. There is no way that any kind of development in Namibia will replace reparation. We are not going to accept that. Reparation is reparation is reparation, just like you say, genocide is genocide is genocide. Reparation is because of the genocide, right? A development aid, no, no. We will never accept that. And it should be very, very clear to the Namibian government and also to the German government that there is no way that we are going to compromise the blood of our ancestors for buildings that they are building. No, they can continue with that. We have had development aid from Germany, the German initiative. It was supposed to be targeting the, the victim communities, the Nama and the Ovaherero. But the, what, did the, what did we get out of it? The Namas got a few guitars, because apparently they are good at playing music, and the Hereros got a few goats. And the rest of the money went up north to develop the, the, uh, the northern regions. So that money did not help anything. And that is your taxpayers, uh, your tax money. So maybe that is also something that you have to take up with your government. Because the money that you earn or that you, yeah, that you earn and paid into taxes is going to waste. It's the same thing with the ongoing negotiations between the two governments. These people travel to and from Namibia. And even the special envoy here in Germany also travels to Namibia. And I'm sure it's with your tax money. And what do they do there? They go and have um, sightseeing t tours in Namibia. Because even when they call meetings, community meetings, where they say they are going to inform the communities, about maybe 10 people turned up. So it's a waste of resources. And it's our resources, but it's also your resources that are sponsoring that. So the Germans can build as many institutions in Namibia as they want, but that is not going to replace reparations. There is no way. Thank you. Vipuka or Paul, do you want to comment? Or shall we open? So I have to confess I forgot about the audience. <laughs> we should uh, open the discussion uh, for the least. I don't know how, how many minutes we will have left, maybe 15? I think, I'm not sure. We, we started a quarter past two. Yeah. I think we can carry on till quarter past four. I'm not sure. Give me a sign. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Niki Drakos. Thank you all so much for um, elaborating on the history and uh, also for the whole conference. I'm very, I'm very touched and very uh, well informed because I came here less informed and now I know much more which is good. Um, I feel uh, I want to say two things that uh, occurred to me. I really liked your uh, sentence, genocide is genocide is genocide, and reparations is reparations is reparations. So it should be clear that genocide, that this was a genocide, and it can be called nothing else and that the only way to deal with genocide is reparations, nothing else. So anything that comes along the way, including the apology, can only be one step in the whole process. So the question came up many times, uh, what does it mean that the Hamburg Senate uttered some sort of apology? I was not there to really understand what kind of apology it was. I really didn't hear the quote so far. But um, there's no cookie to be won 
here. So it's not something that really the Senate can be, uh, can get some, uh, some praise for, I think. There's no praise, no praises to hand out. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so the, the, whatever apology this was, it can only be a first step. That's clear. And also what I, what I, uh, we talk a lot about the genocide and the apology for the genocide. But what became clear here is that what is, what is also happening here, every moment and every day and every year that goes by without apologies and without reparations is a reproduction of the trauma. Yeah? So we're not talking only about genocide. We're talking about repetition of the trauma every day that goes by. And that is a very, very key thing that occurred to me, yeah? uh, especially hearing the particular stories, the family histories and everything. So I find that very important. And um, I came here uh, I'm part of a group uh, from Berlin who founded a political party last year. Uh, we call ourselves Die Urbane, eine Hip-Hop-Partei. A political party, <laughs> a political party rooted, connected with the principles of the hip-hop culture, who um, is whose significance, of course, is uh, telling stories of oppression and telling stories uh, of how to deal with oppression and uh, finding ways out of oppression uh, in its true sense. So we found that uh, inspiring and uh, the, the people involved all come from that background. And uh, in our political program, we included the apology uh, and also reparations for the Nama and the Ova Herero people into our political program. So, um, one idea coming up during the conference is to work on a big campaign uh, in the future to, um, that includes the apology, of course, to, to uh, raise awareness in the German population for the history, for the necessity to acknowledge and uh, to take the steps that are demanded, like you said, that are demanded of uh, the Nama and Ova Herero people. Um, and I want to invite everybody and I want to ask, uh, I already talked yesterday about it with uh, Vipuka, so um, uh, of course this cannot be done. I'm sorry, Nothing may, may, may I, I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting yes. you, but uh, we have only a very few minutes I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm done in a minute, I'm done in 10 seconds. you concentrate on, on questions to the audience, uh, yes. to, to the uh, speakers, okay. sorry. not having, you know, thanks. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wanted to just say that uh, we got involved with Elisabeth Canesa from Dekade für Menschen Afrikanische Abstammung to maybe work on a campaign okay. together and I would like to ask you <laughs> if, uh, if it would be possible to get in touch and to work on a campaign together. Okay, yes. thank you very much. So, are there any more questions? So, I see three people who would like to ask questions or comment. Hi, uh, my name is Senfo Dongtan, and uh, some years ago, I was in Namibia, and I had the chance, the opportunity to meet with the leadership, the Aero leadership. Sister Uje is there, I'm so glad and happy to see her. Actually, I think the fact that after all these years, you people have kept fighting, 
pushing for this agenda is something really great. And I am so pleased to see and to experience that because it shows that you really deserve to walk in the footsteps of our ancestresses and ancestors. So for that, thank you very much. You are a good role model, embodiment of the resilience, the fighting spirit, and the conquer spirit of black people worldwide. So. But now, I want to say something that is important for all the black people in this room. The problems you are having with the Namibian government to be genuine and to seriously support your fight is not a mere issue that affects only you people there. You should know that this fight for reparation is so important, it's so determinant for the future of the relationship between Europe and Africa. So much so that it is no surprise that there is no single African government who ever take a clear stand on this issue. So Namibia is not alone. The Namibia government is not alone in that matter. And remember, the only African leader, almost president, who clearly stood for reparation, Moshud Abiola, he was killed. They arrested him and they killed him. And they killed his wife too when he was in prison. So he was killed in 1998, his wife 1996. So when you see African leaders being scared to stand for reparation on the side of their people, it's not by chance. They know that Western imperialist power are not ready to accept it. And you imagine if Abiola had been leading Nigeria, the most powerful black nation on earth, and supporting the reparation agenda, of course, this will have changed the game of the fight for reparation. Instead of it, only the people in the diaspora have been fighting for it. You as community are fighting. The Kikuyu also, we saw their case with British, but they just fight alone. And that's the thing that we should understand. We Africans. So that's why we need to do what it takes to change the political situation in our countries, to have new leadership, new social political movement that would not be afraid to challenge white supremacists, to challenge Western government, and to tell them that until unless we have discussed and addressed reparation, they have nothing to do in Africa. So that's what we have to fight for. And the more you people kept, kept pushing for this agenda, the more it also gives us the courage and the energy to push for the fundamental political change that will bring about a new African leadership, a new African government, so that together we will get the reparation our ancestresses and ancestors deserve for the crime that white people have committed on them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. So I want to acknowledge all your presentation. This has been highly wholesome. Oh, my question will be in the area of land. <clears throat> and I want to say something because a former professor of mine on land and property once said like, the last colonial question is a question of the land. And if we look into all the Sadak, Sadak region, the issue of the land has become one of the major issues now. Because one thing the colonial tried to appropriate when they invaded our land is the land. And when they left, they did not solve this problem before they left. And it has become one of the major problems in the Africa, especially in the Sadak region. While you were talking, you make a reference to the South Africa who are now pushing on the issue of the uh, 
expropriation of land without compensation. And I hold the view that we should have like a movement like EAF in all the Sadak region because all this land were taken through the genocide. And I don't think that the land should be given back eh, and compensate the people. We cannot compensate the people who took the land by the genocide. And I also hold the view that we should do all in our possible interest to really see like all this white supremacy that I think from my own view that they are still suffering from what I call prima donna white supremacy syndrome. We have to isolate them in the sense that they should be the one who will bring the issue on the table. I totally agree with you that we want to be very much careful and very much sensitive on how we deal with this issue of land so that it won't result into the economic issue. But however, it is our land. They should be the one who have to make a move because if you look into the South Africa today, the whole South Africa economy, it is, it is an appetite economic system, which means that appetite is the one who is still controlling the South African and all the Sadak region. So from my own point of view, and from my little experience and from what I've been trying to figure out, it's like we should have a very powerful movement. And we have to be clear that expropriation of land without compensation is the only way. And if there should be a negotiation, if there should be a way out, they should be the one to come to us because they took our land. The land was taken by the genocide. Our forefathers were killed. So what I also want to say is also like we have to have this movement expropriation of land without compensation, no negotiation. And we have to go on this from my own point of view. So another question and another thing I also want to talk about is the issue of this, our government, who are really a puppet for this colonizer and the imperialist. And I want to, and I want to really acknowledge what you have been really doing because like in my own country, Nigeria, we have really a very bad government. Most of the syllables that really emphasize about the colonial era, they have taken it. When I, when I was undergraduate student, I have to study, I have to read a book called How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. The book has been taken away. So most of the Africa, most of the Nigeria, we don't have the full knowledge on how European, they really invaded and how they committed genocide in Africa. And I don't know how we can deal with this, our corrupt leader in Africa. Maybe you have an idea, but I also want to say like, this kind of initiative that you have stood up for our people, I really appreciate it a lot. And we are also doing it here also. I am a set of refugees from Lampadosa in Hamburg. We are also be fighting for the right to stay with all that initiative. And we will continue to do the little we can do to really have a very sound and effective change. Thank you very much. This is just Thank my you very contribution. Much. Okay, here's one last question and then we close it. Yeah, is, is it a question, then we make it the final, you know, question and answer. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I don't speak very good English, so it's colonizers in English. My question is uh, to my brothers, the young guy, because it's very important when you spoke about uh, German, German, and I want to know about like uh, the German Namibian people who is there and who was born after the genocide. The youngest, how is your, your how you are working together, and did, did they really recognize this uh, genocide and they speak about it and be really like uh, they don't like it, they feel really bad, and how you handle with these youngest? Did you really work with them together to try to to tell them or to try with them together to know that this German made this genocide and if maybe they will also help to push 
the German who are there first, and then the German who are here to really, I will not say reparation because I don't know how it's work, because this reparation also maybe they will feel they are youngest, they are not, it's not do, it's not, they make it, so maybe it's for them something else, but how do you think we can connect as youngest together with this younger German, Nanubians, to push this out to really make like not only a petition, but really to push from this white uh, German who are in Namibia to say, hey, we need this now because we are Namibians also. Even if it's our parent or the old parent make this, but we really need from us as white youngest with this Namibians, black guys also, to say together we don't accept it because the time is changing. The time is changing. We don't have to stay as like 100 years ago. And I want to know about the German also, the German who have this uh, Landes, did they feel maybe if the German people from here say, okay, we recognize the genocide, we excuse maybe they will lose the land or that what it is? Yeah, that is my question. And last, please, as what Abimbola said, we are a group of refugees here fighting since five years to get our right to stay. We really want, if they have Herero and Nama people here or that in Germany or that everywhere to connect with us because we are all, always on the street fight for our right to connect the struggle and to fight to get right for this and to get to recognize this and to the reparation. Thank you very much. Uh, we will thank, take, we, 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 thank you for that insight, both um, brothers from Nigeria and my two refugee brothers. Uh, one have to, and I think it was spoken about before the, all the speakers ahead of us, and including us, genocide is not a discussion in Namibia current state. It just has become to the forefront. Uh, it is not taught in schools. It is not written in our textbooks. So you cannot start a discussion when there's no foundation is oral history. We learned from our grandparents, parents, as, or as it was orally retold to us. And then those who are fortunate enough to read about it, read it or research it through, the Germans kept good records. So there's much of that that you get from the Blue Book and all the other uh, literatures that is out there. So culture is local. And the local culture in Namibia does not discuss genocide, except maybe in the past few years now where it will hit a newspaper here and there. So that discussion, my brother went to a German school. It was never spoken about. Uh, my uncle lives next to a German farmer. They don't speak about genocide. So we have to start there. Thanks. Yes, on the last question, uh, a very important question indeed uh, from my African brother uh, regarding the um, what is the what is the what is the feeling feeling of um, of those local Namibian Germans? Um, just a week ago, um, there was a um, front page article in one of our oldest. Uh, uh, weekend newspapers, the Windhoek Observer, uh, with a big uh, article on the front page that says, local Germans denying the uh, genocide, uh, which was a very terrible, uh, um, um, I mean, uh, that article is unacceptable. And um, what I will try to say is that, um, as I have mentioned earlier on um, Slugger is one of the um, spokespersons also of the local um, German uh, Namibians uh, in Namibia. And that's why I was uh, throwing this proposal to, to, the, to the conference to be uh, part of, the, of our uh, um, resolution to, to call for to make a demand for the recall of Slaga as as as, uh, as the as your representative in in Namibia. Thank you very much.
Yeah, thank you. For my conclusion, I would like to remind you which are we are descendants of the people who fought Germany without any weapons. They used sticks, they used their kiris, while the German had weapons. We are the descendants of those people. And we are going to take Germany by the horns. We have taken them to court. People were saying, what? You, you are not even 10% in your country. How can you take the mighty Germans to court? And how do you expect to win? But we did. And I assure you, victory will be ours. Thank you. So, thank, thank you there, all. There were so many... Um, sorry, sorry. Thank you all for... We closed the panel, but there's the last word to, to you. Yes, uh, I wanted to actually touch on the question of uh, these other developments that we talk about that Germany is carrying out in, in Namibia. Yesterday, I alluded to the fact that I was born across the border in Botswana. Guess what? These developments that we are talking about, although Kambanda has already addressed it in terms of distinguishing between AIDS and reparation, I just want to bring to you that my, my brothers in Namibia, particularly the Namas and the Herero, they are crying foul of these developments that are taking place in Namibia through the German aid. Because Germany is at, uh, uh, on record saying 80% of global aid goes to Namibia. But me, as somebody who is half living in Botswana and in Namibia, I want to share with you that if the, or can we imagine if the people that are in Namibia, both the Namas and the Ova Herero are crying foul of such aid, what do you think about the Hereros that are in Botswana and South Africa? So for them, it's zero. The other thing that I want to remind the, uh, the, the audience is that the Convention on Genocide talk about punishment and prevention. We continuously are reminded and ridiculed, like my brother is saying. Actually, what uh, the ambassador to Namibia of Germany is doing, he is busy perpetrating genocide against us. He is torturing us. But when you look at our relationship with uh, uh, the German Namibian residents, the whites, if I may put it, we have what I would call a healthy relationship because we haven't gone to the streets and back at them. But they have the audacity, actually, to stand up and say whatever they say. But if our governments, including Germany and Namibia, they had done something, even regulating some of this behavior, we wouldn't have had some such things because, actually, the convention itself is giving them that you know, power to regulate, to punish, and prevent. That is very important for me. Because when you look at Germany, for instance, how they have approached the Armenian genocide, I can't even talk about the, the Holocaust, they have passed regula I mean, a legislature which says Armenian genocide is genocide. And I think they do commemorate it here. But what about their own genocide that they committed in Namibia? What we receive is insult, ridicule from the likes of the ambassador. So I think it's high time that we looked at the convention itself in terms of prevention and punishment of those that are continuously reminding us or, or even opening the wounds of, of genocide. Thank you so much. So thank you all very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry we have overdrawn very much. Uh, but I give the word to Tom, uh, and maybe you say something about the time of the next break and when we start again. And thank you very much, all. And thank the all to the to the presenters.